Okay, let's um, start with chapter two here and uh, discuss some um, company analysis. This really directly relates uh, to the continuing case uh, portion of this uh, of this uh, class, or at least the majority of it. We're going to complete a, do a complete financial analysis, uh, or at least of these ratios of of the company and the industry in which your company is in. So. Um, what I'd like you to do is kind of follow along. Uh, most of this, quite frankly, should be review. Uh, we're going to just talk a little bit more about the analytical nature of ratios. What do they mean and how can you ultimately use that data? So let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. And how you're going to start this, and you should have already completed most of this, hopefully, is you should have already input data into the financial analysis spreadsheet. And certainly you should be doing this before you get to the first night of class. But let's talk a little bit about what that looks like first. Here is the spreadsheet. Again, you should have downloaded this. Make sure you download it. Don't use, uh, certainly you can go out there and you can just uh, open it, if you will, online. Um, the challenge is you can't save anything online. So, um, I wouldn't do that, uh, quite frankly, if I were you. But uh, anyhow, when you open it up, if you're at the main menu, if you look at this uh, thing down here, here are the courses that I teach with, that you can use this spreadsheet with. Down below on these, uh, these tabs are all the menus and all the spreadsheets. So if you go down across here, you'll see that they are listed alphabetically uh, across the bottom of the page. Um, this is sort of under construction now. I've been making some major changes, and uh, some of it's complete, some of it's not complete, but it's certainly it's still all usable. Uh, when I can have this completed, which should be within the next, uh, uh, hopefully the next month, um, uh, I will we'll make sure that you get the updated version so that you can use this uh, whenever you want to, maybe for other classes, etc. We're obviously in Finance 630, so if you click on that key, um, you'll ultimately go to the menu. See, I'm obviously working on changing and moving some of these things around. Um, quite frankly, uh, the only thing this page is used for is the menu, is, the, is to give you a click position or a, a link to click on to go to a certain spreadsheet. If you can't find the spreadsheet that you're looking for in this stuff, it's always a, along the bottom here in alphabetical order. So the one we're going to use here is the financial statement analysis spreadsheet. And I can click on that here. It takes me right to that statement. Or, quite frankly, I can go back to the main menu. Oops, I'm sorry, I clicked the wrong button. Go back to the main menu. All right, go to that finance spreadsheet. And if you click on the button, it'll take you right to that page couple things to recognize as you're working on this. The data must go from left to right. So the rightmost column will be the most recent uh, data that you have. This is not the way the annual report is typically set up. It's set up in reverse order. They want you, as an investor, you want to see the most recent numbers next to the labels. Uh, we're creating ultimately uh, a, a very large spreadsheet here where we have this the most recent five years data. We have the financial ratios that are calculated for you. And then as we scroll across, there's other financial statements all in this left to right order. But if we go over a ways, we'll actually come to uh, what's referred to as pro forma forecasting, where we can utilize this data, we will by the end we get to the end of the class, to do a prediction of next year's financial statements. So as we go across here again, the yellow boxes all are indications of places to put data. But in this case, what we'll ultimately end up with, as you see here, is here's the five years of historical statements. And we can predict up to 10 years of future statements. That then gives us 15 years worth of financial ratios to analyze. So what this will allow us to do is to make predictions, do some strategic planning, if you will, for the company to ultimately try to forecast 
number one, where do we want the company to go? And number two is what do those decisions do to the financial statements of the company? So it's a, obviously a very complicated spreadsheet. Make sure you follow down below here where it says negative interest expense. You need to enter that as a negative number. Taxes, it's negative. Uh, some of the other data, you may have to go outside of the spreadsheet. The stock price is going to come from an exercise we do in gathering historical prices. So this data will come to you over the next, uh, uh, well, you should already have this data. I'm going to ask you to input these industry average ratios. We're going to do that hopefully before the end of the first class. But we'll be able to input these data so we have the industry data. From there, we move into the financial analysis of this company. Here is the balance sheet of this company. We have some terms that we'll be discussing throughout the, 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 the course. Um, what's the book value of this company? Uh, again, the book value is approximately uh, $7.8 billion. Um, if you go out here, you see that the actual market value is about $8.8 .8 billion. So the company is obviously worth, um, it's worth more to the market than it is actually to the accounting people, but not by a tr tremendous amount. Stockholders' equity is the first measurement. How do stockholders, how do the, how do the accountants evaluate or determine or illustrate the value of this company? Um, certainly we want this number to be positive. When this number is negative, it's indicative of a company that essentially is in bankruptcy. It's in severe trouble. So one of the challenges of, of this number is obviously negative numbers are very bad. But we also have assets that are not even captured onto this balance sheet. Um, we're looking at book value. So the real estate value of the company is not incorporated here. The value of patents, trademarks, um, copyrights, none of that is incorporated into the book value of the company. So for those companies with lots of real estate and lots of those intangible types of uh, uh, assets, um, Frequently, their value just doesn't show up in the, in the book value. The market value is determined by the stock market. It's the market price times the number of shares. Obviously, it cannot be negative, And we certainly would hope that it's greater than the book value of the company. In the last chapter, we talked about maximizing stock price. So if you're making the stock price go up, then you should have a value, a market value, that's greater than what the accountants are declaring, since the accountants use historical pricing and market value is current pricing. We have the income statement of the company. We're going to talk again in some great detail about how you analyze the income statement. What about the statement of cash flows? Probably one of the more important of all of the, the financial statements to illustrate how managers make decisions. In fact, you can see they're listed right here. Here's the cash from operating activities, from running the company, net cash from investing, the buying and selling of assets within the company for use of the company, capital assets, uh, securities, those types of things that they invest in. And then finally, what is the cash flow, that uh, the net cash that comes from the financing portion, the decisions of the company of how and when to get money, how and when to return money to investors. So the net change just reflects the overall condition of uh, the statement of cash flow for this year. And in this case, you can see for most years, it's going to be positive. But there could be times with uh, uh, large amounts of uh, uh, investing where this number could actually turn out to be a negative number. We're going to talk about how you ultimately do this. We'll actually do this in class where we identify these numbers. Where do you find them? How do you input them into this spreadsheet? And then ultimately that's how we analyze the company. So we've come a long way and we haven't really started yet. 
We want to talk about balance sheet analysis. We're going to look at four different components of how we analyze the balance sheet. Liquidity is the first part. Liquidity just talks about how quickly it takes us to convert cash or convert assets into cash. Current assets are the most liquid. Fixed assets are obviously then the least liquid. And some fixed assets are actually intangible. You can't touch them. So the key component here is safety. The more liquid a company is, the less likely they will not have challenges paying their short-term obligations. So liquidity gives us a picture of safety, ability to pay the bills that we currently owe. As you go through this spreadsheet, you'll notice that these or this presentation, there are numbers that follow ratios, and some of them have letters. The numbers reflect ratios that are incorporated into the paper that we're going to write uh, about the, the this company's financial uh, uh, stability. It, it's your financial analysis of your company. The numbers show ratios where we also have a um, industry number to, to help with our analysis. The letters represent ratios that are important, but the, um, that number is not available to us uh, from our industry analysis. So we, we just don't have that number. So let's move on and talk about liquidity. Here's a picture of Coors's liquidity. As you see down below, we're looking for increasing trends, right? Uh, there should be a large decrease from current ratio to uh, quick ratio, dependent on the amount of inventory in the company. Um, if you notice here, again, just as a sidebar, make sure you use line graphs with markers. Um, always do this in the same order. Company ratio, industry ratio. Company ratio, industry ratio. If you do that, the colors will stay sequential throughout the the program and it'll be easier for the reader to follow because you start to look for colors rather than necessarily read and try to reestablish each legend. It just makes it easier for the for the reader. So what do we know about Coors? Over the last three years, Coors has a slight increase in current ratio. It's getting more liquid. It also has an increase in its quick ratio. But what I want you to pay attention to is the distance here between the two. It's a very small distance. Now let's look at the industry. They were a little bit more liquid, but now it's less liquid than the industry. And the quick ratio is far different than what the industry is. It's actually moving in the other direction, and it's much the, the gap here is much higher. So what can we say about cores? Coors is getting more liquid in general, but in a very conservative sense, the industry is getting less liquid. And with this big gap, we can say that we have a pretty good picture that the industry on average um, holds a lot more inventory than what uh, Coors does. So Coors is very liquid and doesn't hold as much inventory. The cash ratio just gives us a picture of, in general, you know, how much money's in the checkbook? And you can see over the last uh, five years here that the amount of cash available has increased substantially. So Coors is actually getting to a point where they can almost pay off all of their current liabilities, all of their current bills. They can almost pay them just by writing a check. That is indicative of a company that is very liquid and uh, shouldn't have much of a problem paying its bills. The next set of ratios refers to something called efficiency. How does this company actually work? Right? I mean, there's two things we want to kind of analyze here. Can they produce sales with the things they've purchased? And can they produce profit? How do they utilize these assets? So we want to look and try to understand Again, this is really a management question. How well do they manage the assets of the company? Do they have the right amount of assets? 
Do they have too much, too little? What decisions are they making? The first set of ratios here on the right-hand side are the ratios we really want to pay attention to. We have DCI, DSO, and DPO. DCI is the number of days on average that inventory sits on the shelf. And I think, obviously, you probably know you want less inventory on the shelf than more. But we have to make sure we have stuff on the shelf so that we can make inventory and we can make sales. DSO is the average number of days it takes for our creditors to, uh, or excuse me, our customers to pay us what they owe us. An accounts receivable is a, a bill that's owed to us. Of course, we would like this to be smaller rather than larger. DPO, accounts payable outstanding, talks about how long it takes for us to pay our bills. And of course, we don't necessarily want this to be very short, but we don't want this to be tremendously long so that in the end it hurts our, um, our credit rating. So let's look at inventory. Again, how many days does it sit on the shelf? We're looking for decreasing trends. As you can see here, Coors has a lower number, indicative of less inventory, than the industry. And it seems that uh, both seem to have a little bit of a growing trend, but uh, Coors still is, uh, is in a position where they have less inventory than the industry itself. Again, one of the questions in the end we always want to ask is, you know, just because we have less, does that make us better? Right? We probably have less costs. We don't have to pay for insurance. We don't have to pay for people to move it around. We don't have to pay to store it. But on the other hand, are we losing uh, potential sales because inventory is scarce? Those are deeper questions than we'll ever be able to get into uh, with respect to uh, this course and the company itself. Day sales outstanding. How long do people owe us bills? We're actually going to find out that this is one of the weaknesses that Coors has, especially over the last several years. Somewhere in this range, 06 to 08, there was a uh, merger that took place between Molson, Coors, uh, between Mol Molson and Coors. And from that point on, we're going to find that they have challenges with um, accounts receivable that they, they, they really don't have much control and people are not paying them very quickly. I'm not sure why that is. <clears throat> it, <coughs> it could be the business culture in Canada where contracts and the normal course of business is that uh, there's a slow pay compared to what it's always been in the United States. But there is a difference here. And we, as managers of the company, I'm certain they would want to have that, uh, an understanding of why that's true. Would they like it to be lower? Absolutely. If it's part of the culture and part of the way the industry, uh, that country works, if you will, then uh, they may not be able to do anything in the short run for this. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. And obviously you can see the course has a much higher number, so the, their customers take a long time to pay. Days payable. We also see that certainly over the last three years, course has an increasing uh, days payable um, compared to the industry. And I think this is probably indicative of also their customers not paying them very quickly. Again, it's not terribly bad. It's around, uh, if you look here, 54 days is the number of days. Uh, but we're, we're paying slower than the industry. The industry is down below 30. Um, again, you know, what, what kind of arrangements do we have with our creditors? Um, you know, are, are there discounts that we could be taking that we're not taking? There's many questions that we need to ask. And as managers, we would, as financial analysts, we would be asking them why this is true. And hopefully we could get some answers from them. The uh, next set of management ratios or efficiency ratios reflect more a relationship to sales and the kinds of assets and, and our asset base, if you will. Fixed asset turnover talks about how well we use the assets that we've purchased to do our business, 
our fixed assets, how well do we use those to generate sales? And of course, we would like this number to be bigger rather than smaller, but uh, you know, sometimes we don't have uh, uh, much control over this number. Total asset over just obviously looks at total assets rather than just the fixed asset component. So let's look at these numbers. Again, we would like these numbers to be larger, but we have to watch about them being too big. We don't want the, the numbers to be so large that we're overusing and beating up our equipment. If you look here, the industry is more efficient than Coors is. Uh, Coors just shows lower amounts of, of uh, asset or, or fixed asset efficiency. And we also see that with respect to total assets, Coors also has lower numbers. So with what we would say with respect to total assets is, you know, there's a possibility that maybe we have too much assets. Maybe the asset base is too big given the, um, the, the business that we're in and given our current sales level. As you probably know, over this time frame, we've been in a little bit of a recession. So it's quite possible that these numbers are dependent on economic uh, times. Uh, the definition of a recession is no sales. So when sales go down, these numbers go up. So uh, we do need to have some uh, understanding of current economic times uh, when we're analyzing especially these two ratios. The next set of